what other facts emerged after the plane has disappeared in the months after the disappearance? What do we find? Did we find any debris? What did the investigation show us? Okay, so the next important thing to know is that as they looked at these signals, they realized that whoever was on board this plane hadn't communicated using it. This, so this is the satellite communication system. Yeah. You use it, it's almost like your cell phone, you know, you have your cell phone in your pocket. It is communicating with a cell phone tower, but if you're not making a call and no one's calling you, no one's texting you, it's just communicating the cell phone tower saying, hi, I'm here, but there's no information going back and forth. Yeah. That's the state that the, that the SATCOM was in. It was lying dormant. And it's important to mention it was yeah. booted up specifically at a particular point. Right? Okay. Yeah. This is a major, major, major clue. Yeah. Um, but let me say one other thing first before I get to that, which is that because we didn't find out actually until later, what we, the first thing we heard was that it, they had the data and then that the, the data hadn't been carrying any messages but it had been pinging, they were called pings, because it's basically like your cell phone just says to the cell phone tower, hey, I'm here. Yeah. If, you, if anyone's calling, just this is where I am. Mm -hmm. So every hour, if the, if the thing wasn't used, the satellite would say, hey, are you still there? Because remember, the, the clients are planes and ships and they leave. So they want to, it wants to know, are you still in my area? Because if you're not, I want to stop worrying about you. And so these pings happened automatically. Two, two calls actually, because Malaysian Airlines was like, where's our plane? And they tried calling the airplane twice. Yes. Yes. Um, the calls went through into the, tele the, into the onboard um, telephone system. It rang and nobody answered. That, that could have some significance that we could address later. And another pilot also tried to reach out and heard static and mumbling, I believe. So after it had, this is a, this is a parenthetical, right? Somebody okay. claimed later that he'd called the plane and the plane answered with mumbling. The thing is with a radio, you don't, it's not like f calling a phone where like I'm calling your phone. And if you, if I hear you mumbling, it's you. A radio, if someone's mumbling, you don't know who it is. So that whole story didn't make any sense, okay. but it did get a lot of play. So the, um, they looked at these signals and it turns out that there were two components of the metadata that were significant. This is where I have to really struggle to be concise because this, this is where it gets really complicated and the, and the details of the complications really matter. Yeah. But let me suffice to say that from the metadata, it turned out that due to some unusual circumstances, you could actually determine where this plane went using this metadata. You shouldn't have expected to, but you could. And it showed that it went into a particular part of the Southern Ocean. Uh, fast forwarding several years, they actually spend hundreds of millions of dollars to search this area. It's a technical marvel. I mean, I have hats off to them. Three miles deep, a thousand miles from the nearest land. They're using brand new cutting edge technology to um, scan in photographic detail the seabed. The plane is not there, okay? That is the fourth vanishing. The plane keeps not being where it's supposed to be. I, I, I called my, the, I have a, a book about it. Did I call it the plane that wasn't there? Yeah, my first, my first Kindle single I did about it was called the plane that wasn't there because it kept not being where it was supposed to be. Um, so, baff, so it's bafflement after bafflement after bafflement. Um, now, you mentioned that, okay, so where did this data come from? Everybody assumed when this information was dropped that even though whoever turned off the, all the other electronic systems that, that made it go dark from air traffic control screens, they had forgotten or didn't know to turn off the SATCOM system because most people don't know about it. I've talked to many, many 777 pilots since then, and they don't know that like there's a way to unplug the SATCOM system. However, somebody on board this plane did. They unplug, they, they, they electrically somehow unplugged this box and plugged it back in. And only because of that did the signals resume. This to me is the crux or one of several core clues in this mystery. Because if you're investigating a mystery where the perpetrator does something, you can reduce the, the list of possible suspects to those suspects who can do that thing. Yeah. That was done, right? If the person spoke Italian at some point, like <laughs> then I'm 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 innocent because I don't speak Italian, right? So whoever did this was sophisticated enough to do something that the average triple seven captain 
doesn't know about. And in fact, in my podcast, I talked to a very experienced 777 captain who was actually part of the original flight test program of the 777 when it was first rolled out. He worked with Boeing engineers and talking about the different things you can do with the, with the different planes systems, planes, different systems. And he, he was like, I wouldn't know how to do this or I would never do this. He would never do this. A captain, an, a, tr a normal 777 captain would not do this thing which kind of cuts against the idea that it was the pilot, the captain, Zahari Ahmed Shah. So already I'm like, okay, this is much weirder. I'm thinking this is much weirder. And, and you're hearing a lot of people talking about, well, because listen, everyone is talking about what happened to this plane. What could have been the explanation for why this plane disappeared? And what you're hearing a lot in the different forums, I was running a forum myself, Occam's razor, simple explanations are best. People are saying like, statistically, um, it's probably mechanical failure, right? Yeah. And that approach is dead, dead, dead wrong. You know, you can't take a statistical approach to a, a unique event, you know? Um, you know, statistically, nobody um, discovers relativity, you know, or, <laughs> solves, or solves the mystery of quantum mechanics. So like nobody does it. So the chances that Niels Bohr did it are very, very low. Yeah. Well, okay, human beings do unique things all the time. So I guess I've been trying to argue from very early on that this is a deeply strange case. It's complicated. Now I mentioned that the, that the scientists were able to use, to interpret this Inmarsat data to tell you where the plane went. The way that they did that is complicated. They published scientific papers about it. Most people haven't read those papers. If you, if you publish a book, book or do a podcast without having understood uh, w what their methodology was, you're really making noise without any, anything behind it. One thing I want to point out about that data. So there's two metrics that you use, right? BFO, burst frequency offset and BTO, burst timing offset. Using that data, you're not able to pinpoint the exact location, but because of the way, I guess, waves travel, you can pinpoint a concentric circle on the map and you can pinpoint it will be on a certain arc right? We're using the BFO data. Right. And one of the things you pointed out, we're still not going to go into the theory yet, okay. is that the BTO data and the BFO data had some contradictions. So they both didn't point in the exact location that you expect them to, right? It both did not point, like they would, you didn't expect the plane to be in the southern part of the Indian Ocean by looking, by trying to use both the BF and the BTO data. I know you are itching to go into the details. Well, I, I will just say that like, that is a, that is just one example of a principle that exists throughout this case, which right. is that if you have two sets of data that could indicate some aspect of the case, they won't just, they won't agree. They will, cons you have consistent disagreement amongst the different data sets. I agree. Okay. Fantastic. I think you have pointed out some great uh, details, observations, findings. I had listed down some observations and facts and findings as well that I want to quickly just rattle off. You got it. So that we can create hopefully a much wider picture. Yeah. And then we walk into the theories. But okay. as I talk about these observations, I would love it if you can tell me where I'm going wrong. I'm going to use the word allegedly quite often. Sure. And if you feel you want to add them something, please yeah. let me know. Okay. So first observation. When it comes to the cargo, apparently there was a consignment of lithium ion batteries right. in the cargo. Yeah. French investigators have also claimed there was a mysterious load of 89 kgs loaded into the flight at the last minute and not scanned. The validity of this claim is still under question. Right. Okay. Second observation. Few facts about the pilot. Authorities found that Captain Zahari had flown a similar path in his flight simulator at home in the previous month itself, very similar to the actual route that MS370 took. Even though the simulated flight was run into the Indian Ocean all the way to fuel exhaustion, just as speculated with the actual flight, this was labeled as not sinister in nature, as Zahari had flown thousands of other routes on that simulator. But one thing of note is that this is one of the few parts where Zahari had apparently manually progressed the flight in that section rather than let the simulator play it out itself. Some people have raised the question whether the simulation report is false or planted especially because this was revealed nearly two years after the plane disappeared. Mm -hmm. One comment about the co-pilot was that this was his first flight without a supervisor. Every flight he's been on before, he's had a, a minder or a super, supervisor right. because he was training, right? right? And this was going to be his first full fresh flight. But back to the piloting command, Captain Zahari reports on his character are mixed. 
Many colleagues and family members describe him as happy, likable, very well respected as a pilot. No red flags in his history at all, which is in strong contrast to when you look at a case like and just Lubitz, for example. Sure. In hindsight, you can see all the red flags. But even with this pilot, in hindsight, no one could see any red flags. He used to make YouTube videos in his in his free time. But there have been other reports of some people who have said that he was lonely, separated from his wife and often confided in friends that he was depressed and used to pace around in an empty room. This is all alleged. Allegedly, his wife and kids moved out of their house the day before, not confirmed. And he was known to have extra marital affairs, not confirmed with the, with the cabin crew. Her observation. Some people, including you, <laughs> have raised the questions about the validity of the NMASA data. We just spoke about that especially the contradictions between it. I'm going to put an asterisk on that one, yeah. but we could. Okay. Back to yeah. It. You have raised the question that not that the data is wrong, right. but whether it was planted and by that means what we think it means. I think it's important to draw a distinction between what my issues with the MRSI data and then, and people who just question validity of all things. Yeah. The only thing I want to point out is no one is taking that data as just like gospel. There is, there are questions about the authenticity of it or what that means. Just want to make that okay. observation. And okay. we'll ob we're definitely going to dive into the, okay. your okay. theory. So that's going to cover sure. this. Okay. For the observation, allegedly after the flight went missing, some of the family members of the passengers tried to make phone calls to their relatives. A couple of them reported that the phones were still ringing for days after the flight went missing. This always gives me chills. In the Netflix documentary, they also claimed that a woman received a call from her father who was on the plane, but before she could pick it up, it got cut. Right. This is popularly known as the phantom cell phone theory. This one is obviously all alleged, but there's another fact about cell phone, which is that at a certain point when the plane crossed Penang, the co-pilot's phone connected with- That did that, happen. That That's did happen. Real. That's real. With the network tower, which at least proves, I guess, that I don't know what it proves. There was the some was, question as to whether the primary radar target seen pulling the 180 and flying up the Malacca Straits really was MH370 and not like a drone or some other plane. The Malaysian authorities themselves said that the reason it took them so long to announce that this data had been observed was that they weren't sure that they weren't hundred percent sure it was MH370. That put that issue to rest. Yeah. Fifth observation. This is something I find very interesting. There is a claim that the aircraft turned after the aircraft turns from South from Penang, it was put in a 22 minute holding pattern off the coast of Sumatra. I don't know how valid this, this claim is. One of the aspects of the Inmarsat data is that you have an infinite number of ways to generate that data. So you have to use some statistical fancy techniques in order to winnow down the possibilities based on what's, what's, what's probable and what's not probable. There are, there are things that could have happened that they're, they're not, they could have, they match the data. So you could have put this plane into a holding pattern for 20 minutes and then it would have flown. And that would have, that would have changed where it wound up on the seventh arc. So it's, it's someone, it's someone has observed that this could have happened. Yeah. And if you want to think about the universe of all the possible endpoints that this yeah. plane could have had, that would be. Then why did this theory like get a lot of wind? Because there have been a lot of reports about this holding pattern off the coast of Sumatra. I mean, you could take a holding pattern at any point in the arc always. Why this one in particular? Well, so what tends to happen is that a person will come up with an idea oh. <laughs> and then they'll say that this idea is what happened. And that's, that's a problem. We have to, we have to, ideally we can recognize the difference between a possibility and a theory or a, a, just an explanation, you know? Yeah. Okay. Noted. Listen, I came here to your awesome studio to talk to you today <laughs> and I might have stopped at 59th Street Station to get a bagel. So then you go on, new, on, the, on the network news and say, Jeff got a bagel at 59th Street. Why do you think that? I mean, I could have. You have no reason to think that. It's, it's among the many possibilities that could have happened. In fact, it didn't happen. Gotcha. Residents of a, this is again alleged, residents of a remote island in Maldives called Kuda Huwadu in the Thal at all reportedly saw a low flying jumbo jet on the morning of March 9th. Yeah. A lot of questions about the validity of this claim. Seventh observation. I must mention that many people have raised questions about the authenticity of the data that's been presented 
the investigations conducted by the Malaysian authorities, a lot of people have said it was incompetent, a lot of obfuscation of facts, whether the reports were edited, changed to make themselves look good or not. A lot of people have raised those questions. All the authorities in question have come in question. The official narrative in quotes is under a lot of scrutiny. Must point that out for sure. And oh, one more observation, which is about the debris. Yeah. An American named Blaine Gibson uh, was surprisingly lucky enough to find a lot of debris very quickly after so many people have been looking for it. Right. One of the most conclusive pieces of evidence that was found was this flap run that was found on the French island. Not of, by him, but yeah. Not by him. Right. On the French island of Reunion. I don't know. Pardon yeah. my French. The interesting thing about that piece of debris is that you have said that it's definitely from that plane. It's been proven that it's from MS370. I mean, I, it, it, there's, there's, there are, um, there are some serial numbers inside the flap run that are traceable to the factory in Spain where it was made. Um, so I, let's never say a hundred percent. Okay. But I would, I would personally subjectively say like 99.99. I'm just calling it true. The interesting part is that even if it's 99% from that plane, the barnacles that were found on that plane do not represent the barnacles you would expect to find if the plane had actually crashed in the Southern Indian Ocean. Yeah, which is, I'd, I'd love to talk a lot about that because that's actually what I think, where I think we can actually try to nail this thing. We'll park that aside because we are going to talk about your project. Okay. So that's okay. the place to talk, but I wanted to bring that out that this did happen. This is where I should say, and I should have said it way up top. I think we can solve this mystery. I'm here not just to, you know, gab and, and flap my jaws. I want to solve this plane. I want to find this plane and I want to just talk. I want to try to convince people that we found it. And I think that's, I'm trying to convince people that there's a methodology that is fruitful and that there's questions we can ask and data that we can uh, obtain that could we can solve it. Yeah, this is definitely an exciting project. So we will talk about it. Okay. But I wanted to bring up the debris because I'm sure in some of the theories this might come up. Right. Okay, I think we have covered all the observations. Is there anything else you want to add or we can go into well, the theories? You, so let's go back. Okay, cargo. There was mysterious cargo, mangosteens, lithium batteries, all these strange things. Here's the thing. As you're trying to solve a mystery, you collect all the evidence you can, and then you try to construct hypotheses from it. Not every fact is going to fit into your hypothesis. There is, there, you're going to find evidence that is not probative one way or the other. One of the most popular YouTube videos about this mystery by a, a very talented YouTuber named Mentor Pilot, he spends a lot of his mystery talking about this call that was made between Zahari and air traffic control. And he wonders like why he made this call. It's strange, but doesn't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't shed light on any possible theory. So why worry about it? Were there weird mango scenes on board the plane? Yeah, there was weird mango scenes on board the plane. We don't really know why, but it doesn't, it doesn't, help us resolve what happened one way or the other. It's irrelevant is I guess what I'm saying. Okay. People come to me and they say, Hey, there were all these software engineers on board the plane. You should look into it. And I say, look into what? <laughs> I don't, I mean, they, if you want me to explain how they took the plane, I don't see any way that they could have taken the plane. Did somebody want to steal them? Maybe, but that doesn't tell me how th those other people who supposedly wanted to hijack these people did it. I think you get my point. So that's the comment on the car. Any comments about the pilot or the co-pilot? Um, Oh, I mean, we don't, yeah. I mean, you raised the point that there was no red flags about Sahari. Um, that's true. Some people have, I think it's irresponsible. There's, there's, there was one famous American uh, aviation journalist who said, oh, I had this like, you know, anonymous source who says that he was having a, a marriage. This is the problem with anonymous sources is that a lot of times what will happen is, I know this, this has happened. I've heard about this. You say to someone like, you're, you're Zahari's like, uh, used to work with Zahari. And I say to you, what, what do you think happened? And you think, and you say, I think Zahari took it. And I, I, my assumption is like, oh, a guy who used to work with him thinks he took it. Why do you think he took it? Because other oh, news all says that he did. You know, and so, we, and so you shouldn't think that just because somebody says something, that that means they have any informed basis for saying it. There is, we have no confirmation of any kind of marital problems, debts, mental illness, anything that would make this guy do a, such a heinous and unthinkable act. There are cases of, of, of airplane pilots flying their plane into the ground to kill themselves and everyone aboard. They're incredibly rare and they are, involve people who are on the edge 
of mental instability. Um, that is, I mean, it, there was one just actually quite recently where a guy tried to like deploy the fire extinguishers aboard the engines of a plane that's happened last year. And yeah, there's no signs of that, which is kind of a, I did an episode of my podcast about the dog that didn't bark in the night. And that is kind of like, how do you explain a guy who had, and like, you look at his YouTube videos and I see a guy who was the sweetest, nicest, most emotionally stable, chill. This guy's, this guy's had it made. He had this like lifetime job. He was going to get a big fat pension. He had like multiple houses, multiple cars, you know, his family life sounded great. Yeah. It's one of those cases where you see what you want to see. I saw the same thing, but there yeah. are people who see his videos about plugging a window and they're like, oh, why is he in the newspapers? The headlines yeah. are sending a message. Exactly. So I know. <laughs> there is one, there is one piece of evidence. And, and I have, I was the one who first publicized it. It was about the fact that he had this flight simulator. And there was a, he, a month before he took the plane, uh, or he, supposedly he took the plane, he flew a flight that, as you said accurately, wound up in the Southern Ocean with zero fuel. Um, and there's a lot of questions. Why don't we have more of this data? What, can we have more information, please, Malaysian authorities, about the provenance of this data and so on? However, I would say that, again, it's all in the eye of the beholder. Is it proof positive? Now, this is not a flight that went to Agari and did a 180 and went up to Malacca Straits. This is a flight that just went up to Malacca Straits without that sort of whole Agari part, which is really a baffling and hard to explain part. Yeah. Um, and after he did that flight, it's worth noting, he did other flights. He like did a kind of recreational flight in a DC-3. He did another flight, I think, in a 737. And to me, I'm like, if you are planning to kill yourself and you're, and you're using this flight simulator to kind of practice killing yourself, do you then like, just for sheer amusement, like do something else? Yeah. Something that people who are de depressed enough to be suicidal experience is a condition called anhedonia. You don't feel pleasure. So you're not, I mean, you're actually in a state of agony. Um, you, you mentioned Andreas Lubitz who flew his plane into the, into the uh, Alps and killed everyone on board. He was at the edge of his rope, at the end of his rope, because he thought that his career was over. He thought he wasn't going to be a pilot anymore. He was going to lose his identity. He wasn't like playing Mario Kart. You know what I'm saying? So I, I do feel that like, uh, although I do think this this is the, the only damning evidence against Zahari, and I think it is definitely deserves consideration, careful consideration. I would like to know more about it. I don't think it's the smoking gun that some people think it is. We don't even have data whether he had conducted similar flights that ended in fuel exhaustion somewhere else in the world as well. Because when I play a game, I try to break the game as well. Like, right. I, like if I'm playing like any like a racing game, I try to crash into things. Like you try to do things that you can't do in real life, right? So, well, the way he said it too is like he put it to three thousand feet and he put the fuel to zero, and that's pretty much exactly what happened to um, Sullenberger you know, the miracle on the Hudson. So yeah. I wondered if, even that was over water too. It was right, yeah, right <laughs> over here. Yeah. You probably see it from your window. Um, <laughs> but, and, and then there was another one that, that, that he set it for higher up. I think it was like at 30,000 feet and he set the fuel to zero. And that looked a lot like another really famous case called the Gimli Glider, um, where the, the pilots ran out of fuel uh, and had to find a way to, to land. And they did, it was actually amazing. So, Maybe he was trying to do something else. Also, the data is incomplete. We don't really know. Hard to form. A, this is what we have to do. When, you, when you're when you trying to solve a mystery, get all of the data. This is a main part of my message. Get all of the data and understand it as deeply as you can. So both broad and deep understanding of all the available data. And you have to make, and then you have to get hypo, all the hypotheses that match that data to a more or less degree. And I'll tell you, nothing fits all the data perfectly but something happened to this plane. So there is an explanation that fits all of the data. Now, sometimes data can be wrong, you know? Um, like the case of this, uh, this flight simulator, we don't know every aspect of it. There might be some part of it that is more or less damning about him. Awesome, and then the final few observations, and I had said all of this is alleged, so yeah. the people who saw in Maldives, who saw low-flying jumbo jets, some people yeah. said it could have been a Saudi jet as well. Again, it's like when you take all of the evidence, you know, one of the things that's very standard in air, tra air crash investigation is that eyewitness accounts, which 
intuitively, we give a lot of credence to, well, many people have been sent to death row on eyewitness testimony. It's actually very, very unreliable. I can see that. Also, phantom cell phone theory. I mean, that's one of my main beefs about that. I thought the Netflix documentary in general was, was well done. I spent a lot of time talking to them and I think they really understood what I was saying. The inclusion of that call, I think, was a little bit irresponsible because they kind of leave it hanging. And if it was true, it would be a huge deal. And I just don't think it really happened. And I mean, the idea that somebody would say, oh, hey, my grandfather who's missing on this flight is calling me. What should I do? Let me go talk to a stranger and ask them for their advice about whether I should get, I should accept this call from my grandfather who's missing on the plane. I don't know. People react differently in moments of panic. There's a, I had an English lesson called the monkey's paw about this. Oh yeah. Where someone from, came back from the dead and started knocking on the door and people started panicking. I don't know what the first reaction would be. Well, at this point, no, but this was the day of, I mean, they weren't, it wasn't like they'd been, they hadn't been pronounced dead at this point. Nobody knew where they were. So, but let me also say that what we tend to forget now, because we have much more clarity now on what happened. At the time, it was a swirl of rumors. Many, many reports in the reliable media turned out not to be true. 